from the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador. This is from the South. I'm Jose Daniel Lopez. We start in Argentina, where social organizations are calling for massive demonstrations on Friday, the same day the G20 summit is set to start in Buenos Aires. The summit comes as Argentina suffers an economic crisis which has seen the value of the national currency plummet. Tens of thousands of security officials are also being deployed throughout Buenos Aires, effectively shutting down the city. All social organizations in Argentina will take to the streets on Friday. We want to express our rejection of the G20, of Trump, of other imperialist leaders, of the agreement between President Macri's government and the International Monetary Fund. Argentine people are the resistance, and we will continue to resist until we have the chance of giving a dignified life to every resident in our country. A number of leaders have already arrived in Argentina for the summit. Among them, Saudi Arabia's Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. Following the murder of journalist Jamal Khashoggi, Prince Mohammed had hoped to rebuild his reputation at the summit in Buenos Aires. But now a prosecutor in the Latin American country has agreed to take up a case against Bin Salman for possible war crimes committed in Yemen, where the humanitarian situation is worsening. Still in Argentina, the People's Summit has kicked off with various social groups and political movements coming together in Buenos Aires. The summit aims to discuss an alternative agenda to the G20 summit. This will be done through lectures and workshops on many topics including capitalism, LGBTQ rights, feminism, among many others. The organizers are also planning to protest in front of the country's Congress on, on Thursday, a day before the G20 summit begins. Our correspondent Sabrina Rod is in Buenos Aires and brings us more. The G20 summit has attracted large-scale protests around the world. This Friday and Saturday, world leaders will meet in the city of Buenos Aires. On Tuesday, we witnessed the first massive rally organized by social and political movements. They're strongly criticizing IMF-imposed policies. Meanwhile, the People's Summit will take place in front of Congress. A number of meetings will also take place over the next few days while the summit is in session. These include forums led by the Continental ALBA movement, the World Lawyers Network for Food Sovereignty, and the Continental Union. Thank you, Sabrina, for that report. Moving on to Chile, public sector workers have been protesting to demand the government address help them improve their working conditions. On Tuesday, they held demonstrations outside the presidential palace. Let's find out more in this report. They wanted to enter Constitution Square, but security forces cordoned off the area. This is bad because repression still exists in Chile. The dispute between the current government and the public sector broke out over salary negotiations, which they usually hold at the end of each year. Every year the government, but especially the current right-wing administration, doesn't improve the rights of public sector workers. In fact, they increasingly curb our rights and salaries. Public sector workers asked for a 7% salary increase, but the government has decided to freeze it at 3.1%. It is an embarrassment that the government is trying to give us a raise of 3.1% instead of 7%. These demonstrations represent the feeling of over 350,000 workers across the country, but their concerns appear to not matter to President Sebastián Piñera, who was hosting his Peruvian counterpart inside the palace. When workers have bigger incomes, the economy improves as well. So when the government of President Sebastián Piñera only gives pennies to workers, they don't only harm them, but in fact the whole country. The situation doesn't look good for workers. November 30th is the deadline for any salary negotiations. If they don't manage to reach an agreement, then there won't be any salary increases for 2019. And what's worse, it is also the last day to renew work contracts which is why many people fear there will be massive layoffs.
Public workers are set to continue their demonstrations as they fail to reach an agreement with the government. They are unable to agree on a new salary increase on Tuesday as both the finance and labor ministers were absent from the meeting. Union leaders have said they are left with no other choice but to continue with their demonstrations. The government has not progressed on the matter, so public workers' movement will continue to mobilize to keep putting pressure on them. We hope we can reach an agreement, and if we cannot reach that agreement, it will be the government's responsibility, because it has not been able to articulate specific proposals. Our correspondent in Santiago, Paola Dragnik, brings us more. There have been three days of national strike as public workers are trying to negotiate their wages for 2019. As of yet, there are no answers emerging from labor unions meeting with the government. Workers are demonstrating and the Chilean government has responded with the use of water cannons on the protesters as they wait for information about their salaries in Constitution Square. Thank you, Paola, for that report. And workers from various public sectors in Guatemala are also protesting against the government cutbacks. They say the proposed 2019 budget will affect many different social programs. Let's find out more. Doctors working in the public sector have been protesting for various days outside Congress. They had asked lawmakers to increase the health care budget by 77 million U.S. dollars, which would have been used to boost doctors' salaries. But lawmakers refused to. I would ask of the president to live on my salary, to see if he can do it, if he can be the breadwinner at home, raising kids, send them to school, put a roof over their heads. Education sector workers are also protesting outside Congress. The only public university in the country has had 38 million U.S. dollars cut from its budget for 2019. A program that will be greatly affected by these cuts is one that provides free legal assistance to low-income communities. We provide legal aid to around 8,000 cases per semester. With these cuts, there will be a lot of people left with no access to legal help. These budget cuts to social assistance, health and education is in stark contrast to the proposed increase in funding for the army, totaling 85 million U.S. dollars. Protesters find this situation utterly baffling. Health and education must be prioritized before the army. We are not at war. We need to give people access to health care. People die from preventable diseases. Congress has until the end of November to approve the $11 billion U.S. budget. Some lawmakers are trying to make last-minute changes to the fiscal package to hopefully increase the allocation to social programs. The Ecuadorian Ombudsman's Office has spoken about the situation of former Vice President Jorge Glass. In light of Glass Health, they have urged the judiciary to decide on its position with regard to his medical attention. Glass has been on hunger strike for over a month, condemning the inhumane conditions he's been healed in as well as what many call political persecution against him. We stay in Ecuador where the vice president has been accused of soliciting financial contributions during her term as an assembly member. Our correspondent in Quito, Denise Herrera, tells us more. Hello, good afternoon. The Vice President of Ecuador, Maria Alejandra Vicuña, has been accused of making illegal contributions to her assistance for her political movement. She was accused by one of her former advisors, Angel Zagbay, who said that when she was lawmaker in the National Assembly, she took bribes from people who wanted to take particular posts. She said yesterday in a press conference at the palace government that I have nothing to hide and will never participate in actions that are not attached to ethics, which is indeed the flight I have raised throughout my life and the characteristic of my actions both public and private. She told the media and rejected these accusations and also said that she will start an investigation to prove her innocence. Also, the Attorney General of Ecuador, Ruth Palacio, said that her office will open an investigation under these allegations. Also today, here, the Secretary of Communication, Andres Mil. Chilena talked to the media and said that the message of the, of the president, Lenin Moreno, is clear and is the justice, the institution that will prove her innocence or will prove the responsible of these actions. It's all the information we'll have for now. Back to you at the studios.
More news in a minute. Stay with us. Welcome back. A group of about 100 migrants have been deported from Mexico and are heading back to Honduras. The migrants have reportedly given up their asylum request in the United States and now are on their way to their home country by plane. The Mexican Commissioner of National Immigra Migration Institute claims the migrants are leaving voluntarily. Mexico's government says it will deport 500 migrants who try to cross onto U.S. soil as U.S. border troops fire tear gas at them on Saturday. The president of the United States is angry right now. If he dies of a heart attack, we will pay for it. That is why I'm leaving. I don't want to be an accomplice to that death. I left a five-year-old boy in Honduras, and I'll be happy because I'll see him, hug him, and never separate from him. As the migrant caravan grows, conditions in Tijuana's shelters are starting to worsen. Many migrants are living in crowded conditions with limited access to toilets and on only two rations of food a day. Following their failed attempt at crossing the border on Sunday, many were left shell-shocked and in fear for their lives. Crossing into the U.S. illegally has proven to be near impossible, so now the migrants have to consider staying in Mexico and waiting for months as their asylum requests are processed or turning back and heading home. Our correspondent in Mexico, Alina Duarte, has more. Hello, we are here in Tijuana, Mexico, where around 6,000 migrants have arrived to this shelter. Around 200 have been deported after trying to cross the U.S. border last Sunday, and dozens of them have decided to go back to their countries they asked to be self-deported. Yesterday at the press conference, the migrants requested a number of things, including that the U.S. speed up the process to seek asylum, that the incoming Mexican government create a commission willing to negotiate with the migrants who wish to stay and to stop the arbitrary, manipulate, and involuntary deportations. Additionally, they pleaded for solid information that could help uh, to make better decisions and protect their lives. And members of the migrant caravan have made a series of demands to both the Mexican and U.S. governments. We request of President Donald Trump to accelerate the process of asylum in the United States because everyone has the right to ask for political asylum, as my colleagues said, that a commission is formed by the new government of Mexico that comes to negotiate a presidential solution for those who want to stay here. Today is when countries are needed to come to the rescue of all the migrants. We are suffering. We are not suffering because we want to. We need to bring our families forward. And what happened on Sunday was a peaceful march. Many people have their families back in Honduras, starving and went out to work to feed them. Over 2,300 migrant children are living in the Tornillo Emergency Detention Camp in the United States. The camp was opened last June by the U.S. government. It has capacity for 360 minors and is a temporary shelter. Currently, there are more than 2,000 young migrants detained there waiting to be reunited with their families. They range in age from 13 to 17, and most have come from Central America. Now we say, now we say to you. A Brazilian Catholic priest has said that the jailing of former president Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva is part of a scheme by the current administration to instill fear in the population. Pedrinho Juarezki added that this scheme also involves attempts at criminalizing social movements. The priest who visited Lula in jail on Monday said they talk about injustice and oppression that PT members and minority communities are currently facing in Brazil. And the Brazilian Supreme Federal Court is said to analyze an appeal presented by the defense of jailed former president Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva in December. 
Lula da Silva's lawyers presented this appeal to ask for the invalidation of the legal process against him and for the freedom of the former president. They say this is due to the loss of impartiality of former judge Sergio Moro, who sent Lula to prison and is now president-elect Jair Bolsonaro's justice minister. Lula da Silva has been in jail since April of this year. More and more Cuban doctors are leaving Brazil after the Cuban government ended the More Doctors Medical Exchange program. This decision came after offensive comments made by President-elect Jair Bolsonaro against the medical practitioners. Brazil's rural areas and low-income neighborhoods will greatly be affected by this exodus. Let's find out more on this report. Cinco de la mañana. Every day since arriving in Brazil, Dr. Yamirka Rodriguez leaves home at 5 a.m. and heads to the Jardim Virginia Favela, just outside Sao Paulo. Here, she treats patients at a communal health clinic. But today is different. As Cuba ended its medical exchange program with Brazil, Dr. Rodriguez must now say goodbye to her Brazilian co-workers. She will a very important legacy here. She's a great person, somebody who has cared for a lot of patients. Many cried when they found out she would be leaving. I learned a lot from Shamirka. Close to 2,000 municipalities were dependent on the care and expertise these Cuban doctors provide. This would greatly affect the quality of health care these communities can access. This, in a country where economic inequality has reached extreme levels. One of Dr. Rodriguez's patients embroidered her name on a gift so that she does not forget about her. I had strange wounds on my body and for three years I went to private doctors to find a cure. In one visit, she solved my problem. I thank God for putting her in my life. WhatsApp messages from patients defy the meaning of the word saudade, a word that has no direct translation but refers to a feeling of melancholy. I have cried so much. Every time a colleague or a patient says to me, Saudade de Vosé, my heart tightens, and it's difficult to hold back the tears. I will take all of these people in my heart. Every moment I have lived here in Brazil will be impossible to forget. But I'm moving forward. I will face new challenges in Cuba, new goals. I will continue doing my job wherever I'm needed. Just like Dr. Rodriguez, over 8,000 Cuban doctors have had their dream interrupted, a dream of helping those most in need through a program that provides much-needed aid in 67 different countries, inspired by the dream of Ernesto El Che Guevara. Peru's public prosecutor has issued an order to prevent the husband of opposition leader Keiko Fujimori from leaving the country. Mark Vito, who is facing money laundering charges himself, isn't allowed to travel out of Peru for three years. His attorneys, however, are set to appeal this decision. Just 90 kilometers from the Nicaraguan capital, the Healthy Year program is strengthening food security in the city of Boaco. Known as the two-story city, Boaco has over 50,000 inhabitants. Farming and raising livestock are the main economic activities that support hundreds of families. The Healthy Yard program aims to allow people to grow their own food from their own homes. More and more people in the region are reaping the benefits, with over 8,000 healthy yards and having been delivered so far. The aim is to ensure the production of healthy food for families in places where there isn't much space, in a context of urban agriculture. The development of Capacities and Technological Adoption Center is responsible for this program. And it's not just delivering plants to participating families. They are also providing the necessary training to the beneficiaries who are working their own land. We start by using containers for recycling. We also teach the participants to make organic fertilizer. Additionally, we have warm composting, which we mix with soil to make the substrate that allows the seeds to germinate. Everyone learns using what they have to hand. We explain the theory, and they put it into practice. 
Nimia, who created her own healthy yard four years ago, says that she received a package of plants, including vegetables and fruits, as well as medicinal and aromatic herbs. Before, we weren't sowing, and now we are. We have coffee, cocoa, bananas, we work, sell, and eat from it. And that benefits everyone in my home. According to the Ministry of Family Economy, there are 270, 367 diverse healthy yards nationally, of which 40 percent sell their surplus in local markets. Worker unions in Grenada have called off their strike after the government made a commitment to outline new offers regarding public pensions. The unions are demanded a 25 percent increase for their numbers, but the government has claimed that it can only afford a 2 percent raise and that the meeting the union demands will have serious economic repercussions. Those proposals would be given to us by Tuesday of next week and we would hold negotiations on Friday with the Pension Engagement Committee to discuss those, negotiate those proposals. We'll take, a short break, uh, we'll take a short break now. Join us again after this. abuse of power and injustice. The American journalist Abby Martin covers the struggle for fundamental rights worldwide. Deepen into the series of files which uncover the empire's strategies. Through our screen and web platform in English. The Empire Files with Abby Martin. Tuesday, only on Telesur. Welcome back. Nigerian President Muhammadu Buhari has visited soldiers wounded in a Boko Haram attack last week, which left over 100 soldiers dead. He encouraged the troops to remain strong and committed to what he called eliminating the Jidaist group from the face of the earth. There has been a recent upsurge in Boko Haram's attempts to overrun Nigerian military bases, with more than 17 attempts in just the last three months. A former rebel leader in the Democratic Republic of Congo, accused of mass rape and crimes against humanity, has gone on trial in a militia court. Tanbo Seko and his rebels are accused of raping more than 300 women in 2010 in the east of the country. Seko, who found the Duma Defense of Congo militia in 2009, is also accused of theft and looting, as well as recruiting children into his militia. Now let's take a look at some other stories making headlines from around the world. More than 30 civilians have been killed during U.S. airstrikes in Afghanistan's Helmand province. The deaths are the latest in a growing civilian death toll caused by U.S. airstrikes in the Afghan war. Sri Lanka's top-ranking military officer surrendered to court on Wednesday after weeks of evading arrest for allegedly protecting the chief suspect in the high-profile murder of 11 people during the island's civil war. China and Spain have signed a number of memorandums of understanding on trade as part of a two-day visit by Chinese President Xi Jinping, who earlier in the day announced that China will widen the market access for foreign investors and step up protection of intellectual property rights. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov has accused the United States and other European countries of encouraging provocative actions by Ukraine against Russia. Russian border patrol boats on Sundays fired on, boarded and seized three Ukrainian vessels after the Ukrainian vessels strayed into Russian-controlled territory. I think it should reflect Washington's standards to indulge any and all action taken by the Kiev regime, even inciting them to provocative actions. This is really regrettable. 
we come to the end of this news brief. These and many other stories you can find it at our website at telesurenglish.net. And join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Telesur English, I'm Jose Daniel Lopez. Thank you for watching.